Hi there. So there is one gaming franchise that reigns over the get-together, that being Mario Kart. Any gathering will inevitably end in some variety of kart racing action. Any gathering that I'm attending, anyway. So today I thought we could take a look back at the series beginnings, the starting line if you will. The year was 1990, and Nintendo development studio R&D4 had just finished development on futuristic racer F-Zero. Lead producer Shigeru Miyamoto, you might have heard of him, tasked developers Tadashi Sugiyama and Hideki Kono with converting this single-player racer into a two-player experience. Before long though, Kono and Sugiyama realised that to get a two-player version of F-Zero to actually run on the SNES, some serious changes would have to be made. First off, the tracks. A major part of F-Zero is its long, looping tracks that seemingly stretch off into the distance forever. Well, they were out of the picture. Rendering one camera view of these tracks was within the SNES's capabilities, but two camera views? That would be too much to ask. Kono and Sugiyama came up with a solution though. Instead of long, straight tracks, they would use short, winding, interconnecting tracks that all conveniently fit within a relatively small square. Phew, now the console could cope. Another change that had to be made was the car's speed. Now, F-Zero is all about speed. You're constantly trying to make tiny optimizations to increase it even a small amount. However, for the SNES to handle two players, the cars would have to move considerably slower. At this point though, with its winding tracks and slower vehicles, the game was beginning to look less like a car racing game, and more like a kart racing game. Kono and Segiyama decided to run with this idea, reading books and watching videotapes on the topic. To help research the game, Kono decided a trip would be needed. A trip to the local amusement park of Nemu no Sato for a day of go-karting. When he asked Miyamoto for permission, Miyamoto grumpily replied, Why? Can't you tell what they're like without driving them? Eventually though, he gave in, and the team set off. Riding in the carts gave the team a sense of the low perspective that go-kart drivers have, and the g-forces they experience. The primary objective of the trip though, was to experience what drifting felt like. Unfortunately, the go-karts at the resort were specifically designed not to drift at all. Ah. Well, at least the dev team got a fun day out of it. <laughs> Still, Kono and Sugiyama didn't give up on their idea of letting the team experience karting for themselves, so they devised a plan. They would build a remote-controlled car. Not just a cheap supermarket one, either. A proper professional one. It had an actual engine rather than an electric motor, and was over 50 centimetres long. After tuning up all the components and even painting it bright colours, Kono and Sugiyama gave it its first test run at Nintendo's head office. It was really fast and really loud. And so they returned to the development studio, go-kart in hand. It was finally time for the programmers to experience karting physics for themselves, to see how go-karts controlled and what drifting felt like. With bated breath, they handed over the controller to the main programmer. Five seconds later, and it was smashed to smithereens, completely beyond repair. Oops. Kono and Sugiyama decided to cut their losses, and the team started working on a prototype of the game. As a stand-in for the actual characters, men in overalls were used. Yes, men in overalls, no relation to Mario. At first, the team planned to use relatively realistic physics for the carts, but they soon realised that that wouldn't make for a very fun game. Lead programmer Masato Kimura later stated, I spent a lot of time studying the physics of speed, friction, inertia, but I soon realised that if I followed the rules of physics faithfully, the controls didn't feel like a game at all. It comes down to this. In a real car, the feel of the steering wheel is like an analogue device, but the SNES control pad uses digital on-off switches. Because of this fundamental difference, I had to go back and tinker with the controls over and over until I approximated something that felt right. In their testing, the team realised that it looked really cool if you stopped one of the carts and watched the others fly past it. Because of this, they decided to swap out the guys in overalls for some more interesting looking and recognisable characters. 
And, well, when you think of Nintendo characters, there aren't any more recognisable than Mario, so they tried putting him into the game. And it worked! It looked great! Now they just needed seven more characters to fill out the roster. The obvious next character to add was Luigi. Not only was he well known, but he also stood out well from Mario, with a distinct colour scheme. For the next five, they settled on Yoshi, Peach, Toad, Bowser, and Donkey Kong Jr., as they too all had recognisable silhouettes and were fairly well known. However, the team couldn't decide on their last character. Eventually, they threw in Koopa Trooper. Apparently, Goomba didn't get a look in. After that, the team moved on to an idea they had early on in development, Battle Mode, where players use items to attack other carters. Now, most racing games don't have a battle mode, it doesn't really fit with the image of a competitive, serious racing game. But in the words of Shigeru Miyamoto, the very fact that battle mode has nothing to do with racing is what made us want to add it and give it special attention. It helped strengthen the image of the game. It's not, you get to become a world-class racer, but rather, you get to race around and play in this go-kart with your friends. Now, battle mode changed a lot throughout development. At first, it was much more bare-bones, with players driving around a completely empty area, with no obstacles to be seen. The carts constantly shot out balls of energy, which were used to attack opponents. For every hit, you'd get a point. However, in early tests, the team found some issues with the mode. After spinning around for five minutes in an empty void, players became very dizzy and had to stop playing. Because of this, obstacles and landmarks were added. Now let's address the elephant in the room, the items. Whether you love them or hate them, it's pretty hard to argue that they're not an integral part of the series at this point. All the way back in the early days of development, when the drivers were just guys in overalls, the player's only means of attack was throwing oil cans onto the track, which would cause the other carts to spin out of control. Why oil cans? Well, according to Kono, oil cans seemed appropriate for guys in overalls. Uh, sure. However, once the carters were replaced with Mario characters, oil cans didn't seem very fitting anymore, so the team decided to replace them with banana peels, as Donkey Kong Jr. was a character in the game, and banana peels are famously slippery. It made sense as a replacement. However, the team decided that they also wanted a way for the player to attack the carts in front of them. They thought about what would fit the world of Mario, and eventually settled on Koopa shells. This new item system was modelled after Japanese Tests of Courage, or Kimodameshi, where children explore dark, creepy locations while their friends wait to jump out at them. In the words of Miyamoto, you experience fear even if nothing happens. It's precisely because you don't know what's going to happen that makes it intense. This new item system introduced this element of the unpredictable into the game, but the team still felt it needed an item to really shake up the game. After some deliberation, they settled on a lightning attack, which would strike down all the players. How's that for drama? However, if it wasn't balanced carefully, these new items could turn the game into pure chaos and spoil the game's balance. The dev team spent a lot of time working on this careful balance, until they finally reached a point where they felt the item system would help players doing poorly catch up without feeling overly unfair. And eventually, through many iterations, this prototype became the go-karter that we know and love, and on the 27th of August, Super Mario Kart was released. At the time, Kono and Sugiyama didn't realise the impact that their game would have on the world of video games. Mario Kart is ubiquitous, even with non-gamers, and has become a household name. For a little project developed by only eight people, that's pretty impressive. Hi there, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end, I hope you found this interesting. So if you've seen some of my other videos, you might have noticed that this one looks a little different. I've always wanted these videos to look kind of papery and handcrafted, but I really went at it with this one. So if you like it, let me know, and if you think it's distracting and bad, also tell me please, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's everything, bye.